So I got a story for you. I was a little hesitant to share it, but I've already shared it with some other people in our church at other services, so I figured you guys can handle it too. But the problem is we have some police officers that go to our church, so, you know, just don't share this, like, super openly, okay? You know, this is just between us, all right? So uh, a few weeks ago, I was driving to church. Um, It was on Sunday morning, driving to church of all places on Sunday morning, you know, and uh, I was driving really early in the morning. It's like 6 a.m. I'm driving there, and I do this thing. It's a really bad habit. I am not advocating for this. This is really important. I am not advocating for what I was doing. This was a bad decision. I was looking for a good Spotify song while driving. I had my phone out, looking for the right tunes to listen to to get me, you know, amped up for the church service and uh, looking for a song. And I was doing a lot of lane changing that I wasn't intending on doing. You know, the signal wasn't on. I was just looking for the song. And uh, I realized, okay, this is not a good decision. Found the song quickly, put my phone away. I realized I'm coming up to a stop sign it, or a stoplight. There's basically one other car on the road at this point because it's really early in the morning and it's at this stoplight. So I slow down, put my phone away. And then something pretty bad happens. Um, maybe you guys have experienced this before. The light turns green and the car in front of me does not immediately take off at the green light. In fact, they sit there for like an eternity at least like three seconds. And as I look through the window, as I kind of tap my horn, you know, just real gingerly, just to, you know, let them know, people got to get to work. I look through the window and I see this person is on their phone. I mean, who would do such a thing? And in my mind, I'm getting real angry. I'm like, this is reckless behavior. Who would be on their phone while they're driving? And then the Holy Spirit does this thing where it immediately reminds me, hey, Jared, you dumb dumb. Remember that thing you were doing, all that lane changing you were doing like 20 seconds ago? Remember what you were doing? And this was not like a particularly like life-changing event, except for that it really began to shape and show me something that I had a serious issue with, and that's forgiveness. And it wasn't just that I had an issue with forgiveness. I think the real problem was that I had an issue with forgiveness and it was making its way to the surface. And I think maybe I've always known I had a problem with forgiveness, but I was really uncomfortable with the fact that I think now maybe other people are seeing I have an issue with forgiveness. So we started a series this last week. It was called, it's called Greatest Hits. And uh, so now we're in week two of Greatest Hits. Last week, Danny preached to you guys, and he opened it up by this discussion about the greatest commandments, to love, each, to love the Lord of God and to love each other and to love beyond all reason to go out of our way to love beyond all reason. And I think that really begins to open the door beautifully to what we're gonna talk about today. Because I think when we begin to talk about love, what that really begins to to, to lead us to is this idea of forgiveness. So as pastors, we we were kind of asked, okay, if you could talk about anything for this series, this idea of like our greatest hits, if we could teach about anything, what they were really asking was, what what is foundational for us? What What are the foundational teachings for us as pastors? And for me, it's forgiveness. It's shaped who I am, not just as a pastor, just as a person. I wouldn't be who I am without forgiveness. I don't think any of us would be without understanding what God has done through Jesus and forgiveness. So that's where I started this whole series at for me is just beginning to understand what forgiveness is and how I could teach that to our church better. So that's what we're gonna dive in today. We're gonna try to dive as deep as we possibly can in one morning to better understand what forgiveness is. Because this is what I think. I think forgiveness is one of the most radically attractive things about the gospel. But I think it's also one of the most difficult things to imitate about the life of Jesus. It's really difficult to imitate that from the life of Jesus. But I hope that we can begin today to see that if, it was, if, if our mistakes and other people's mistakes equally put Jesus on the cross, if his sacrifice was for our mistakes and other people's mistakes just the same, then we can no longer draw a line in the sand and say that I can't forgive beyond this point or beyond this point. That we have to forgive across the board. So that leads me to two points. What I want us to do today is walk away with two points, and I'm gonna give you those today, this morning. Through the scripture and through the Holy Spirit, I want us to walk away with two things. The first is this. God forgives you. God forgives you. Something you've probably heard before, I would assume. But we're going to dive deeper into what that means. And the second is this. Forgiven people 
forgive people. Forgiven people forgive people. All right, so let's dive right in. We're going to start off today in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. If you guys want to open up your Bibles, your apps, however you want to do it, it's also going to be on the screens. But Romans is a book in the New Testament. It's the sixth book. It goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. So Romans is a book written by the Apostle Paul. It's called a Pauline epistle, which just means it's a letter written by Paul that is now part of our Bible. And in this letter, um, he wrote to churches within Rome, this big city. And now we have it today in our Bible, so we're going to read it there. So Romans 5, chapter 5, verse 8 says this, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's read that one more time. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So I think within this short passage, there are actually huge building blocks for our theology. And by theology, I just mean the way that we understand God and our relationship with him. That's all I mean by theology. So we're gonna break this down into two halves. The first half is God demonstrates his own love for us. So I did this like really like smart thing and I just Googled the word demonstrates and I got the definition of it, which is just to prove or to show evidence of. The word just means to prove or show evidence. So God proves his own love for us. That might sound really simple, but Maybe not if you really think about it. So God proves his own love for us. So not only do we have a God that loves us, which I think could potentially be earth-shattering if you grew up without knowing who God is, but not only does God love us, but God wants to prove his love for us. God wants to prove his love for us. He doesn't only say he loves you. He wants to prove it. Husbands in the room, when was the last time that you proved that you loved your wife? You might be sitting there thinking, when's our anniversary? When did we get married? How many years ago was that? For me, it was like a year ago, so it's a little easier to remember. But the fact is, sometimes we think it's enough to just say it. But thank God that we don't have a God who thought it was enough to say it. We have one who wants to demonstrate it, to prove it, to show the evidence that he loves us. Which leads us to the next half. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why is this important? Why is it important that he did it while we were still sinners? This is important because it can never come back to say that we earned it, that we deserved it, that it was because of us. He did it while we were still sinners. He didn't do it because of us. He did it for us. Have you guys ever had that scenario where it's like, oh God, if you would just do this, I promise I'll make better decisions. I promise I'll make it to church every Sunday if you'll just fix this situation. This isn't what God was doing. This wasn't one of those scenarios. This was God fixing it before we even knew there was a problem. God sent Jesus to die on the cross while we were still sinners, while we were still ignorant and disobedient and even didn't know we needed there to be a price to pay. We didn't even know we needed him and still he sent his son. While we were still sinners, Christ died for you. Because God forgives you. God forgives you. This is so difficult, and yet this is so simple. There's no limit to what grace can cover. I mean, have you ever thought to yourself, I'm too far gone. My mistakes are too big. I've made too many. There's no way that Jesus' sacrifice can cover all of these. I don't know if you've ever thought that. But to even begin to think that your sins are too big for Jesus is to look at Jesus and tell him that what you did on the cross is not enough for me. Your sacrifice was too small for me. I promised you, Jesus' sacrifice was the ultimate sacrifice to pay the ultimate and the final cost. The final cost for all sin, not just the little sins. 
God would not have given up his only son to pay for the little sins. It was to pay for all of them. The little ones, the big ones, the same. Because God forgives you. It was God's plan all along to forgive you. So if you've not heard that before this morning, if you've never heard it before, if you've heard it a hundred times and it never sank in, I want you to hear it this morning. And I want you to do more than just hear it. I want you to actually absorb it. I want it to change who you are, to transform you. Because God forgives you. God forgives you. God forgives you. Whatever you did, God forgives you. Tell it to yourself this morning. God forgives me. Say it out loud. God forgives me. Yeah, absolutely. I can't hear you. God forgives me. Now say it to the person next to you. God forgives you. I hope you believe it this morning because it's true. What Jesus did on the cross is the final price for your forgiveness, your freedom. And that's worth celebrating. That's worth being excited about. I don't know about you, but that's, that's why I'm here. That's why I sing these songs. That's why I'm grateful. God forgives you. But I don't know, it's, you hear that, and then sometimes it's like, I, st- I don't know if I still get it. I mean, I hear it every Sunday, but sometimes it's still difficult. And you know what? It should be. Because this isn't one of those things you hear one time and then it's done. And if it ever is, then maybe we don't really grasp it. Because this is so much bigger than us. Because God had no reason. I mean, he had no reason, no benefit, no gain from sending Jesus to die for us, except for one thing, to demonstrate his love. That was it. He had one thing to prove, that he loved us. To demonstrate he loved us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So I think that begs the question, since it's true that God forgives us, How do you think that God feels? How do we think that God feels when we can't forgive each other? So there's a parable in the Bible where Jesus actually teaches on this very topic. And it's because his disciple Peter brings up this same question. So turn in your Bibles or your apps, however you guys read scripture. Um, We're going to be in uh, chapter, or we're going to be in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. And this is a pretty long scripture, so we're going to be uh, walking through this here in just a minute. But I want to give you guys just a little bit of, uh, I just set it up just a little bit, because um, honestly, this is kind of a heavy scripture. Um, It's what I call kind of a kick in the pants scripture. It's kind of heavy, it's kind of hard to read, and it does this thing where a lot of scripture does, where it collides with our sinful nature, and it calls us to live holier lives. And I think that's what the gospel does. A lot of scripture does this, but I think sometimes it's hard to read. And that's, that's what I think about this scripture. But I want to call you guys and challenge you guys to read this with an open heart, an open mind, um, because it might challenge you a little bit, but I think it's good. And I think we need it. So if you guys would open to Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35, and we're going to dive right in. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother and sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him, Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. 
but he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had the mercy, that mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Ouch. I mean, the end of that. He was handed over for torture. I mean, that hurts, I mean, literally hurts to even think about. But Jesus says at the end of this that this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you if you do not forgive your brothers and sisters. So let's recap the story a little bit because there's a lot happening. So just to, to go back through this, Jesus is telling this parable. And this is just a story. These are kind of simplified stories that capture sort of bigger, more complex, sort of heavenly or theological concepts. That's what a parable is. So in this parable, Jesus sets up this master, this king. And this king wants to collect on a debt. He had apparently loaned out some money to a servant, apparently way too much money to a servant. Because this particular servant owed him 100 bags of gold. And I looked up what this is because I don't really know how much a bag of gold is worth. But a bag of gold was also called a talent of gold. And a and 100 bags of gold would have been worth several millions of dollars. So this man, this servant, owes several millions of dollars. Several millions of dollars as a servant. I don't know how he began to accrue that amount of debt, but it would have been a lifetime's worth of debt. He could never have repaid it. Not on a servant's wage. So he's called in to repay this debt, and for, for no apparent reason, this king takes pity on him. I mean, we don't know why, he just, he just does. And he, and he goes beyond just having mercy. I mean, he actually just cancels the debt. I mean, he could have just offered him, you know, another extended 10 years loan, you know. But instead, he cancels it. No longer has to repay it. Cancels the debt entirely. Hands him his life back, and not just his life, but his kid's life, his, his wife's life, everything. Hands it back to him, cancels it entirely, and allows him to walk away free. And we don't even know why, other than he just was compassionate. And if the story stopped there, it's beautiful. I mean, what a story of forgiveness and compassion. And sadly, it does not. We see the very next thing that happens is this man who has just handed his whole life back. The very next thing he does is find someone who owes him a hundred silver coins. Nothing. I mean, a few hundred dollars. He finds a man who owes him absolutely nothing compared to the debt that he was just forgiven, attacks him violently, and demands the money, and when he is not given it to him, he throws him in jail. I mean, what kind of action is that compared to the action that was just shown him, the compassion that was just shown him? It's horrible. It's cruel. It makes no sense. Our minds can't even wrap our brains around why someone would do that compared to the compassion that was just shown him. It makes no sense. But we see that the community around him sees this, this injustice, and they think, this can't be right. This can't happen. So they reach out to the king, and they say, this, this man that you just forgave, he's now thrown this man in prison, and the king, in his anger, brings this man in and says, why have you treated this man this way? I just forgave you so much. How could you act this way? And we don't hear his answer. But we do know that whatever his answer was, it wasn't sufficient to keep him from being thrown in prison until he could repay his debt. And then after all that, Jesus finishes this story by saying, this is how the Father in heaven will treat each of you unless you forgive your brothers and sisters in your heart. I think what Jesus is teaching in this story is that forgiven people forgive people. Forgiven people forgive people. Because this story is hard to believe. I mean, how could this happen? 
really? I mean, you wouldn't just see this happen on the street, I wouldn't think. But then as I started actually diving into this story, I thought, you know what? When I put myself outside of this church, or I put myself outside of even Christianity, I think, if you think about the stories of Jesus and love and grace, and you hear about them, and then you think about the way that people inside the church sometimes treat each other, let alone treat, each other, treat people outside the church, you know, this story might begin to make sense. Maybe it makes sense to people outside the church because Christians should be the most forgiving people on the face of the planet. We've been forgiven everything. We just sat here in this room and said, we are forgiven. We can celebrate this morning. We sing we're grateful because we've been forgiven everything. What a joy it is. But forgiven people, forgiven people forgive people. Forgiven people are not cruel and selfish. Forgiven people forgive people. Have you guys ever tried to uh, sit there and just think about every mistake you've ever made? I'll give you guys like two, three minutes if you want. You can try and close your eyes, just think back. Is that not enough time? I was actually thinking maybe if uh, we do, we got that fall carnival coming off, maybe we could set up a booth, do like a record of wrongs sort of thing, put up all of the mistakes we've ever made. No? All right. Maybe not. The fact is, it would be impossible, even if we wanted to, remember every mistake we've ever made. I don't know if you ever feel this way, but I often feel like I'm making mistakes faster than I even know that I'm making mistakes. People are bringing up mistakes to me that I'm like, when did I make that mistake? I didn't even know I did that. And the beautiful thing about grace is that it covers mistakes we don't even realize we made. Jesus' grace is bigger than even our knowledge of our mistakes. We have an incredible amount of grace through Jesus. It covers yesterday's mistakes, today's, tomorrow's. It covers all of it. So why is it so hard when I've been forgiven everything why is it so hard for me to, to extend that same forgiveness to other people? Why can't I offer that same grace to other people? It shouldn't be so hard. You'd think it'd be easy. But forgiven people are called to forgive other people, even if it's hard. I love this passage. It's Proverbs 17:9. And I particularly like it in the New Living Translation, in NLT. Um, and I came across this passage um, when I first started writing this message, and I thought, I really wish that I had come across this passage a lot earlier in life, because it probably would have had a greater effect on some of the relationships that I've had, and maybe some of the arguments I've had. And it's really beautiful. It says, love prospers when a fault is forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. How often we dwell on things. We just let it sit and linger and we think about it and we get angry and we get mad. But love prospers when fault's forgiven. When it's not about who's right and who's wrong, it's just about forgiven. We're called to be a community that not only lives as forgiven, but lives as forgiving, whatever the cost. Because that is the example of Jesus. But I think it's also important that we take a step back and we begin to talk about what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. Because what forgiveness is not is not forgetting about it. It's not pretending it didn't happen. It's not acting like it didn't happen. It's not burying it deep down. It's not acting like a person doesn't exist anymore or like it doesn't hurt to think about, those things are not forgiveness. I think sometimes we treat them like that's forgiveness, but that's not. What forgiveness is, is removing the desire and the need for vengeance and punishment. Biblical forgiveness is removing the desire and the need for vengeance and punishment. And paired with that, I like to use this passage. It's Psalm 51.1, it says this. Have mercy on me, O God, 
according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Blot out my transgressions. And I love this passage because of this blot out my transgressions part. See, in the Old Testament, you'll see this blot out part, this this blot out my transgressions, because that phrase, blot out, it points to this illustration of, have you guys ever, I don't know if you've ever heard of this thing called papyrus. It's this heavy-duty paper that they would use um, in ancient Israel, and they would write on this stuff, and it was kind of hard to make. It was made from a root. And since it was hard to make, they didn't just want to throw it away. They couldn't just go down to Dunder Mifflin and pick up a new sheet of paper whenever they had to write again. So what they would do is they, they came up with a process by which they would clean it and bleach it and reuse it. So whenever they would do this, this process by which they would clean it is the same phrase as blot out. So when we talk about blot out my transgressions, when we talk about forgiveness, when we talk about mercy and grace, what we're talking about is not just cleaning off the mistakes. We're talking about making a new sheet of paper that is not only clean, but reusable. That we can use again. We're talking about restoration, spiritual restoration, relational restoration of people. So what this means is if you find yourself saying things like, I forgive you, but I'm never going to speak to you again. Or if you say things like, I forgive you, but you're never welcome in my home. Or maybe you say things like, I forgive you, but I don't ever want to see you near my children again. I'm telling you, we're only halfway there. We're removing the need for vengeance and punishment, but we're not allowing for restoration. We're not allowing for the relationship to be reused. We're not allowing to rebuild it. We're just removing the the need for punishment. And that's halfway there. But here's the thing, that's the hardest part. That second half is uphill. It's the hardest part because it's the part that opens up the possibility for pain. It opens the door to be used, to be taken advantage of, to be manipulated. And all of those things are hard, they can hurt. I'm not naive, I know that those things are real possibilities. But I think that if we truly care about forgiveness and we believe in the calling of scripture to be forgiving people, then we have to be open to the possibility that that's what God's calling us to in spite of the risk, in spite of those possibilities. See, when my wife and I got married, um, we had a quote that meant a lot to us that we really wanted read at our wedding. We thought it summed up really eloquently what we thought and dreamed that our love could be within our marriage. It's by the author C.S. Lewis within his book, Four Loves. And it says this, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must keep it, you must give it to no one not even an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. See, I know that this quote is not about forgiveness per se. It's about love. But earlier we read Romans 5.8. And we saw that the one thing that marked God's love more than anything else was forgiveness. His love was marked by forgiveness. So I think as believers, the one thing that should mark our love is forgiveness. Our forgiveness, our love should be vulnerable should be vulnerable. The way we forgive should be vulnerable. If we began to take an honest look at the way we forgive, what would people say about us? These are hard questions. I asked myself some of these questions this morning, and I'm not sure I liked the answers. What would your spouse 
say of how quickly you forgive. This one was particularly hard. What would your siblings say of how quickly you forgive? What would your parents say? What would your kids say? For all of us, it's going to be different. There are people in our life that it's easy to forgive, and there are people that it's hard. We all have those kinds of relationships. But we're not just called to forgive the easy ones, the people that we want in our life. We're called to forgive everyone. Forgiven people forgive all people, not just some people. Let's move to a time of response. Here at First Christian Church, we have something, uh, it's called a mission statement. And our mission statement uh, is, is used to kind of funnel and focus our ministry here as pastors and um, even for you guys um, to help us know the best way to do ministry, the things to say yes to, the things to say no to. It really helps us to, to, to choose those sort of things. And, uh, and here's what it is. It's glorify God by helping people surrender to Jesus and become more like him. Help people surrender to Jesus and become more like him. I love this mission statement. And I love the life of Jesus particularly. And this is what I think is most compelling about the life of Jesus. It's that he had an utter lack of self-preservation. I don't know if you've ever thought much about this in terms of Jesus' life, but he had no self-preservation. It's really bizarre to think about. But he did not in any way hold himself back from pain. I mean, he literally spent 40 days in the desert not eating or drinking. That sounds miserable. I wouldn't probably never do that. But ultimately, when we look at his, his sacrifice on the cross, he did that for a world that did not want him. He endured the cross. He was crucified and claimed guilty for crimes he did not commit. He was murdered for crimes he did not commit. He paid the price for us, endured that pain, and he was not guilty. That is a lot to endure. That's a lot of pain for people who did not claim him or want him. And we want to become more like him. We want to surrender and become more like him. As a body of believers, that's our mission, to become more like him. Can you imagine? Can you imagine a room full of people whose life mission was to become more like someone who sacrificed everything, even their own bodies, for everyone else around them? That's dangerous. Might even change the world. When I started writing this message several weeks ago, I realized pretty quickly that this was going to be a hard message to preach. Emotionally, spiritually, it was just going to be difficult to preach. Because it's not particularly an easy message to write on, to hear even, because it's not a message that's fun, for one, because it's a message that's about how to abandon yourself. This is a message about how to let go of everything that you want to hold on to, to ban everything that maybe you think is good, maybe you want to hold on to it, to abandon it all for the possibility that you're probably going to get hurt, that there's probably going to be some pain because of a greater opportunity that people are going to find their way back to God. And I know that's not easy. I know that's a hard message to hear. But that's the message of Jesus. That's the message of the church. That's the purpose of the church. So my wife and I have uh, a home, and uh, it's kind of confusing when you come to our home because we have essentially two front doors. I don't know who constructed this thing, but it's very confusing to know where to come into our house at. And so we have two welcome mats, just so whichever door you come to, you feel welcome. 
Um, but welcome mats are odd in that, like, they look really nice when you get them, and they only look that way for about a week. Because although they're really pretty, they don't stay that way. Because welcome mats do what welcome mats are supposed to do. They say, welcome home. And then you, you know, rub your, your muddy shoes on them and track all over them and drop your mess. And then you come on inside. It is my prayer, my greatest desire for the church, for our church, for the church at large, that we would just be doormats for the kingdom of God. That we would lay ourselves at the feet of the church, at the feet of Jesus, and we would say, welcome home. Drop your mess here. Step on me. Walk on me. I don't care if I get dirty. I don't care if you step on me. Just come inside. Just come be a part of my home. That's what the church is. That's radical love. And I promise you, that's what forgiveness is. And at some point, at some point you experience forgiveness like that, I hope, and that's why you're here today. And there's a great big world that needs to experience it too. Let's pray. God, we thank you for forgiveness. And we thank you for a great savior who brought it and showed us an example of surrender. I thank for your spirit that lives inside of us and allows us to live out forgiveness in a way that we can never do on our own. That empowers us and gives us the possibility to do amazing things through his name, through your name. God, I pray that you would put people in our lives that challenge us and allow us to bring them closer to you. And we thank you for the sacrifice of your son that makes it all possible. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to go into a time of response and we're going to sing and we're going to celebrate because frankly, we're all here to celebrate that forgiveness that we have this morning. I love to sing. I love to celebrate the worship, through the worship but we're also gonna respond in some different ways. If you guys are newer with us and you haven't been a part of our services, we, we take communion every week. And we have stations, there's I think four stations around the room. We have some tables set up with communion. We take communion every week to celebrate and remember the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. We believe that Jesus went to the cross. He died for our sins and rose three days later. And because of that, we have hope and the gospel and the good news of who Jesus was, that he wasn't just a good man, but he was a savior. So because of that, we take communion as a way to remember and thank God for sending his son to save us. So during our next few songs, you guys can come up and you can take communion from the stations that are around the room. We also have prayer benches that are up here. You guys can come up and you can pray at these benches or you can pray in your seats, however. But we wanna encourage you guys to commune with God, to talk to God. He's a loving savior who wants to talk to you. So take some time this morning to just talk to God. And lastly, we talked about our Give app earlier. That's one way you can give. But if you'd rather give through our Give and Respond boxes that are around the room, you can do that too this morning. That's also a place you can drop your prayer requests. If you have any prayer requests on your connection cards, you can drop those in the Give and Respond boxes again this morning. But I'm asking you guys to go ahead and stand up if you're able, and we're going to continue to worship and sing and respond this morning.